Yeah, let me see. What were we going to talk about? Oh, we were talking. We were talking about the fact that kids scare me to death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd never been able to. Um, sometimes it's like it, it's almost racist, you know. I mean, except that it's not race. It's mm -hmm. it's that age thing. They they well, seem they seem so different, you know. What did you do when your little boy was little? Did the, you do the diapers and all that stuff? Yeah, as much as I could, you know. But it was so hard. It was so. Yeah, well, that's hard for you. Because they're think. they're so different, you know. They don't. It seems like it. They, it takes. It takes. They almost have to be. Thirty years old, or twenty or five years old, before. Really? Before that? Before I feel like they're the same race as I am. They always feel. They always feel to me like they're. Hmm. Sort of from a different planet or something like that. Oh. They're different. Yeah. I don't have any trouble spending time with them. At all. Well, I, I never read any of it. I, I've, I don't know much about that whole uh, literature that's grown up around people. In child raising and that kind of thing? About it. I don't either. I don't know. It's very hard. Do, do you mind if I ask you if you have, I mean, while we're on the subject, uh, how, how paternalistic your your thing with your players is? I mean, do you feel that you're taking care of them in some... Sometimes I do. <laughs> I mean, do you feel like you're actually taking care of them no, 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 financially no. and emotionally? Oh, well, financially, of course, it's, quite, it's a fact. You actually support them, or your activities? At this point, um, we're able to, uh, uh, when we're not playing, when we're not being paid for concerts, we're on unemployment. Yeah. So that makes it, and it's the way things are now, unemployment seems to be, have become a permanent fact of Everybody's life. Everybody's yeah, life yeah. now. So that uh, it's by far the best way of funding a, um, um, any kind of. But a you have to work a minimum number of weeks. Well, we do. You do work. We do. We work. Yeah. At the minimum is twenty, and we we can do that. Do you? Uh, this is a the, th the second or the third. This is the second. We're into the second year of unemployment. Where you, where your activities as an ensemble Supports are thorough enough so that they can, that with the unemployment, it can support the whole Absolutely. group. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But that, it doesn't take that, it takes 20 weeks. Yeah. And that means the other 32 are Th paid for. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <coughs> that you have to, you have, uh, during that, during that, y that first year, you have to get another 20. So, you have to start off with 20, you know. Yeah. Then you get unemployment for the next year, then during the, that first year of unemployment, if you get another 20, you're covered for the next year. So we're into the third year, third year but yeah. the second year, getting it. But what that means for the people in the ensemble is some of the people cannot, like for example, Kurt works full time as a, uh, he's the uh, resident engineer or head engineer or whatever yeah, it is. At a studio. At yeah. a studio. So uh, it's not possible for him. And Michael Reisman is also involved in the studio on some level so that they, d uh, for uh, technical reasons, they don't qualify. Because they have other sources. But of you get unemployment. Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. At least five other people in the ensemble do. Yeah. And uh, what it means is that someone like Joan Lavarro or Dickie or John or Richard or myself, for that matter, when we're not getting a paid uh, a check for a, 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 a rehearsal or a concert, then we get the unemployment. So if you figure it out, that comes out to about we get the maximum, which is uh, so 95 a week is the maximum unemployment. Yeah. You get 32 weeks of that. That's that's 3,000. A lot of a lot of musicians and actors do that. I know that. That's well, a very it means thing. that you've got a guaranteed minimum of uh, if you pay the maximum, which is 190, do that 20 weeks. That's 3,800, and you get the rest another 3,000. That's a minimum guaranteed of like 6,800. Yeah. That's so that that's not that much money these days, but not any money at all, really. I mean, it, but it, it's yeah. enough to like you know you can pay the rent and 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 everyone else in the group has other work. Yeah. You uh, do you do anything else besides no. the group? <laughs> You're the I only one that doesn't have any other work. Well, I d I've had to work in the past, but I'm not working right now. I'm able, but it's only recently that I've been able to get money for uh, uh, for writing music or for being who I am. But do you? F I mean, it, it's sort of it would it's kind of obvious, but do you feel that that uh, do you think that 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 development 
of where you where you're actually where the activities of the Philip Glass Ensemble are supporting these people uh, is that changing your ideas about about what about what your musical development of what you can do and what you can't no. do and no no I don't think really in a way though you see as seconds let's see the group really began eight years ago yeah and we've been together we began actually making any kind of a money at all only in the last three years yeah so the first five years we at this point, uh, the first five years we played together because, uh, well, first of all, there wasn't anything else to do. There wasn't a new music scene except what we did. Uh, we were younger then. There were a lot of reasons why the money wasn't a big factor. Well, it we couldn't have been a factor at the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it couldn't possibly yeah. be. Yeah. At this point, the ensemble is an economic unit. I mean, it provides, I mean, in the same way that I think the Duke Ellington band was an economic unit for yeah. him, the Count Basie band. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, it's just a fact. I mean, and, and it has nothing, in a sense, I think it doesn't, uh, uh, the artistic choices aren't, I think they're not unaffected by it, but on the other hand, uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Oh, here come. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's, uh, it's just another kind of reality. For example, uh, what, uh, what I'm doing now, I've just been working on this piece with Bob Wilson, uh, this uh, Einstein on the Beach, this opera that we're doing together. And, uh, I built the I built a group in. I built the uh, whole, all the music was built around the uh, uh, was built around the ensemble, and then I added the voices. And so uh, it was a way of keeping. You see, I thought of it this way. Well, after the opera's over, we'll I'll get at least two programs of music out of it. Yeah. You know, two two concerts. Two con two yeah. different concert programs will come out of that. Yeah. Plus uh, your recording. I mean, you, you'll have. A mm -hmm. Plus, plus there'll be other things involved in it too, and it makes it. See, for example, when I got into this, I kn it made it much easier for me to work on the opera in the sense that I knew who I was running for. And my music is very demanding to play. Not everyone can play it. I mean, I've s sat down with so-called, you know, with people that are new music people, and some of them had a lot of trouble. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, this, this opera is like a five-hour piece, and like, like some of these people, like Dickie can just, Dickie and Michael or Joan, they, they don't need, they have gotten so used to the discipline of the music and the energy that's required, that, that there's no problem for them. When, when, did, when did that idea of, I don't mean to be historical, but when did, when I, when I first uh, started hearing your music, mm -hmm. actually David was playing with you then, or mm -hmm. he, that was a long time ago, but I, mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. David. David Barrowman. Oh yeah, that was nice. But uh, you were. But when did you get into the idea of, of long? I mean, the, isn't music long pieces? I mean, how did that happen? Uh, well, the time well, four frame and a half hours. Is, you did the you did the music in twelve parts. That's four what, hours. Four and a half hours. That's four hours. I mean, four the hours. opera's for almost five. Yeah. Uh, the the time. I think there are several reasons for that. One is that um, the the uh, mm. partly is that the the music requires that time frame to speak, don't you think? Yeah, I think it does, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's about uh, the whole idea of using repetitive structures and it puts you into that thing. Oh, that's one thing. Uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, when I began working this way, which was mostly by myself, like in the mid-60s, 66, 67, I was working alone. Uh, I could see right away that I was in a much bigger time frame than I had been working in up until then. It simply required it took me 15 or 20 minutes just to get something that I could listen to long enough you yeah. know, for it to work like that. So then, uh, then there's the other thing. Now this is getting into the real historical thing. Is that if you look at it from another point of view, that when I was a music student, the first pieces I was interested. I remember so clearly when I was about 15, I got very interested in Webern. Of course, it's so short. So you know. short. Yeah. I I loved I, especially those string quartet pieces and stuff like that. And I I studied that music. That music, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, in terms of length, I, I eclipsed all of his music years ago. I mean, <laughs> I've written more music in, in terms of length of time. But uh, I think it's just partly that uh, I personally seem to be very subject to the pendulum effect of, you know, like, if I came from, whatever I did before, I'm always doing the opposite, it seems oh, to yeah. me. It I mean, just seems to me that that seems to be true. It's even true of the music I'm doing now. But it's so well. The the difference between the two pieces is is obvious. But it, well, that's well, part that, of it. That's what I was asking you about the the economic thing. It seemed to me that that what happens in uh, 
you see it so often in 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 groups of professional musicians mm -hmm. that that get into that sort of pendulum thing. They'll do they'll, the group will go to an extreme, of mm -hmm. a stylistic extreme or something, especially mm -hmm. in jazz. You know uh -huh. the way you keep referring yeah. to your musicians as being professionals. Yeah, it it it's. It's as much in the jazz professional world as it is in the concert professional world, isn't it? I mean, do you think of do you think do you think of of uh, of that pendulum effect as as affecting you in as I think it affects me all the time world? in a lot of different ways. Yes, partly that has to do with uh, another thing. Like when I was a student, I was um, I was very far from. I don't think I imagined that I would ever actually be making my living as a performing musician. When I was a student, a music student, what you did in those days was that you wrote your music and you gave it to someone else to play. Yeah. And you got a teaching job and that was it, you know, it was very ivory tower kind of thing. And I, I understand that's actually the, the way most people still live. Most people, exactly. Most composers yeah. still live that way. But, uh, and as a student at Juilliard and whatever, that's... In fact, we were discouraged from playing our music in uh, a very insidious way because we were surrounded by such good players. See, I went, when I went to Juilliard, I still could play the flute somewhat. I couldn't play the piano hardly at all. I learned it when I became a... I took piano as a minor when I was there, and I actually began playing the piano fairly late, like when I was 19 or 20. Uh, but I, was, I could still play the flute fairly well, but there were so many good flutists around, it was pointless, you know, uh, to play it myself. when. You weren't encouraged to do it. In other words, uh, the idea was that there were these people there. They were the they were the musicians, and we were the yeah. composers. And when you wrote the music, you gave it to them. Of course, yeah. uh, I mean, I I just I think that was a real defect of that system. Looking back on it now, and it never occurred to me at the time that it was because uh, I was quite willing to. I mean, I couldn't. I c just couldn't play with those guys. They were too good. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So and now I make my living. I mean, I. A, I think of myself as a practical musician, and I'm not as good a piano player as some of the keyboard players I work with, because like someone like Michael, he's really, yeah. you know, he can do anything. Yeah. You know, we've had other, but it's not always required. Like, one of the best piano players we had was a guy named Robert Prado, who was a, actually a trumpet player. But like me, he picked up the piano as a second instrument. And uh, the thing about Robert was his sense of time was just faultless. It was, I could... We didn't even have to count down a piece. I could start, I could just go like this. And we always played together, and it seemed like within the first two eighth notes, he knew that... I tried to fool him, and I couldn't. Yeah. He was re he, and he was a very, very good musician, but he wasn't really a piano Did he, player. Uh, do most of your players come out of a jazz background? Or, or Robert, or? Um, Robert Prado was another boy from Louisiana. He's dead now, he died in an accident. That's a, yeah, I read that. Really, uh, uh, yeah. so, and then, uh, uh, Dickie Landry was from Louisiana. How did you how did you get connected? I mean, it's it's really how funny. do you get connected with Louisiana? Well, it, I came. I was living in New York, and I was uh, a good friend of mine was uh, Richard Serra, and I knew a lot of artists. I've always known a lot of artists. I've graduated, I think I've gravitated to the artists in a way because uh, they were always more open than the musicians. Yeah. You know, and I always like looking at what they did. And they were more interested, really, in what I was doing. In life. And, yeah, it was better. Just better. <laughs> <than that. laughs> They're more interested. So I always had my friends were always there. That's one of the things why I've been in the art world. I've always been in the art world. One, from my, one of my, when I was 15 and 16, my first friends were artists, and I used to go to museums with them. And they showed me, I mean, they taught me a lot mm -hmm. about how to look at things. And not that I know that much about it, so you're bound to pick up something after a while. But, uh, so I knew Dick. I knew Richard Serra, and we were very close friends. We knew each other in Europe, uh, where I had been a student. And when we came back, we started, uh, we were both working. He didn't have, uh, he wasn't uh, able to make a living in those days, nor was I. <coughs> I think my first job in New York, I was a furniture mover, and I, I, I Dick, uh, Richard had just finished that. He was starting to just start to sell his pieces, and he gave me his truck. So I got his truck, and I began moving furniture. Anyway, we were very close, and I worked with him. I was his assistant for a number of years, too, and, uh, which was fun. To you mean building things? Well, yeah, well, yeah, I was. Um, I helped fabricate the pieces. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, and one of his friends was a man named Keith Sonier, who was an, another. Yeah. Uh, uh, who at that? Who? This is back in '67, '68 when we were all getting to New York at the first time, and these people since then have become very much established as the the uh, not so younger now, but they the were art. establishing themselves as, as a young movement that kind of came after the 
minimal movement, which came after the pop movement, which came after the... And so but you're associated with it musically, too. Well, yeah. I am, but you know, it's... Uh, uh, with, you with, mean, with, with Richard Serra? Yes, I am, but that's really happenstance. I don't think, well, we can talk about that, but this whole minimal thing, I think, was... It's because my friends happen to be Richard and Keith, and I knew Don Judd, and I knew all these people, but, and Michael Snow, but I wonder whether that's really true. I mean, I think that was just a handy thing. But anyway, getting back to how I met Dickie, Keith was from Louisiana, and uh, Dickie came up from Louisiana, and I met Dickie through him, and then Richard Peck came up to stay with Dickie, and he started playing with me, and then Robert Prado was a friend, and he came up. It was like, uh, for a while, Dickie had a place down in Chinatown, China, in China, China Square, which is the name of our record company. Yeah. And, uh, that was kind of like a halfway house. People would come in from Louisiana and they would stay at his place. And we, since we rehearsed there also... Pick up guys for the band. <laughs> they, they always did every day. I went on Rusty Gelder, Robert Prado, uh, Richard Peck, and a guy named John Smith who played with White Trash. We had, at one point, we had five Cajuns in the band. They were all, almost all Cajuns, except for John... Gibson and me, we were there. Well, you mean Cajun, you mean it's, it's popular music, though. Oh, I mean, Cajun well, their music. background is popular music, yeah. Well, it's a little bit more than that. It's more complicated than that. Uh, Dickey also uh, was a trained musician in the sense that he, uh, I think he has a master's degree or something, and he yeah. was a composer. He did film music. He's done film music. He doesn't like, uh, he doesn't like to write down music. I mean, he's not that kind of musician. There was a, there was a time in his life when, I, when he did do that, but and at this point he doesn't do that anymore. He played, but uh, they all, all of them were from that back, that's their background. Uh, uh, he, pl Dickie played uh, in those, uh, these, and there's just a lot of music down there, you know, down Louisiana. I was down there once visiting, and we did a concert down there. You've played your music down there? Yeah, yeah. I have. Yeah, what? Uh, uh, and they have uh, real strong ties with, like, John Smith was with, he played with me just once, really, but, but he was a very good friend of Dickie's, and like he was staying with Dickie, and we were rehearsing, and he said, uh, you know, uh, can I sit in, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I said, if you can read it, you can do it. This, and it happened that John couldn't read. He said, I got a very good ear. And by God, he learned the music. He learned it by ear, you know? I said, well, it'll be easier to, to read, to learn to read than to memorize his music. And he said, not for me. And he learned to play music with changing parts, which had some improvised sections in it. We did one concert, I, it was at La Mama, uh, Ellen Stewart, uh, sponsored the concert and went at her little... You were there. I was there. That was the first time that, I heard your music. Right. That, yeah. those, that was... That's why I'm here. That's right. Why <laughs> right. The five porn players, uh, the, five, the only people who weren't from Louisiana that afternoon were John Gibson and me. Everyone else was. That's five other people. Yeah, that was a strange, uh, heavy band. <laughs> it was a very... But I liked it. You know, it gave us something to do. And you know, you get tired of it. You, uh, what I liked about it is that it brought another uh, flavor into the music, yeah. which I think we... Uh, I. Uh, I, I've uh, been conscious of that. Well, the time in your music is very peculiar. It, it, it's hard to find what the roots of it are because it doesn't sound European hmm. and it doesn't sound... Uh, I don't think it's that exotic sounding either. I don't think it sounds Indian at all. Oh, not Indian. No, no, no. Not, a, not at all. But it, does, it doesn't sound like popular music either. It doesn't... I wonder what that is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. kind of, it's a kind of time feeling that's, yeah. that's different from no, other people's time feeling. I don't know why that is. I don't know why there's a... Uh, it's changed since I heard it. Has that, it changed very time. much? Yeah. You know, it's also gotten faster, it's changed. The, your music used to be... The rate of... It used to be... It, seemed, it appeared to me to be very much slower. Yes, right? no. Each piece yeah. seems to be getting faster. Well, that's like what I, we call... Uh, I call that the rate of change, not... not the, the, the feeling of how fast it's the going. The rate of change yeah. of the music. Yeah. Uh, but in the new piece, in the Einstein, it slowed down again. I think it got as fast as it's going to get. And I think it's starting to, I feel it's starting to slow down. It's again the pendulum. <laughs> really? Yeah, really? it's starting to slow down. And now the new piece I'm doing, I just started a new piece, uh, which doesn't, um, I like that. Uh, I'm starting to think again about the, what happened was I started out with a very extended time sense, and gradually the rate of change became quicker and quicker until the piece, uh, the second piece we did, the long piece uh, from Einstein, the rate of change is really quite quick. Yesterday, you mean yes. what we did in yeah, the, the in second the one. Video and yeah. besides that, there's sections in it. There's yeah. different kinds of music in it. Now, and uh, now I'm writing a piece now which is much more like the pieces I wrote in 1968. Without, I mean, less structural change. Yeah. Because yeah. that the the piece yesterday went the the uh, yeah. the way it breaks down mm -hmm. into smaller parts makes it seem to go very fast. Well, that's it, it occupies a lot of time. I right? know. Well, it was another way. See, in a way that I I darn near can't play that piece under half an hour. I mean, I yeah. you know and. Uh, one way of, uh, one thing that's happened is that um, the pieces 
if the rate of change increases, uh, the overall length of the pieces can increase as well. But uh, those things are just, I tell you, I just go along with those things. My, my feeling about those things are extremely subjective. I was know? thinking yesterday that uh, with, when, when, the, when the band, when, when the group of people that you've been working with has been together as long as yours, you must get into things that uh, that are sort of special skills. Oh sure. Yeah. I mean, I yesterday, see, the yesterday. I mean, the, la the the music for Einstein has those strange breaks in it that are that are really special skill kind of breaks. Mm -hmm. it, it, they're very surprising. Which ones are you thinking of? But when the sections change, you just uh -huh. you'd be going, and you, everybody jumps into a new yeah. sort of feeling. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, when I do the parts now, I when I'm running the pieces now, I don't. I, I write the parts for the players and not for the instrument. Sometimes I don't even know what instrument they're going to play. Like Dickie can play alto or tenor or flute. Yeah. You well, know. you don't. It's not orchestrated for. It's for orchestrated. Those. It's orchestrated by the person in a way. Yeah. That yeah. the instrument can actually change. Do you do that in concert? I mean, do you, do in the you make those period. decisions before you reveal the piece? Well, uh, I do it to an extent. Like uh, in the rehearsal period, we'll have uh, pieces that I'll, I'll think it'll be a flute that Dickie will be playing. But when we get right down to it. We may change it. It may become a soprano. But like, when I write the pieces out now, I don't write the scores anymore. There aren't any scores. They're just the parts. Just, just the parts. The, yes. yeah, okay. So there's no need to write the score. No one's going to read it anyway. And it, I tell you, it takes an awful long time to write those scores. And I found a way of getting it. And the only reason I, I started to write the score to music in 12 parts, which is that four hour piece. Yeah. And I spent one, I spent, uh, I wrote, I made a score for part one and it took me about four days. And I figured at that rate, it was going to take a lot of time, you know. Three months to do I wasn't it. going to do it, so yeah. I, said, well, I, I wanted to copyright the piece because I wanted to uh, to make the records. So I, what I did is I, uh, I took all, all my parts, and I called that the lead sheet. Yeah. And I sent that down and said, "This is the lead sheet, and the uh, uh, everyone plays the changes from that sheet, just like a jazz score." Yeah. And they and they they let it go through. I got a copyright on the lead sheet, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a copyright. Mm -hmm. So that meant that. The only reason for doing a score was for that reason. Yeah. The other reason would have be were for foundation people, but I, I just can't do it. I mean, there are, I will not. I, I'm not going to copy out a score. So, so what I do now is that w the way I do the pieces is I write out my part. Actually, I, I sometimes don't write out my part. Uh, what I do is I'll make the notes to the piece. And sometimes I'll never be any. I'll never have a part. Then from that I'll write out. I'll first write Dickie's part, then Michael's part, then John's part, then Joan's part. And uh, so I know it's really for them, you know. I know exactly what I know how Joan sounds, and I know how I know what John is good at. I know what Dickie, and and the, one of the reasons that, that I, I I I try to write to the strengths of, of the group. Do you when you're when you're doing that orchestrating? I mean, apart from the the fact that it's a fixed ensemble, uh, do you think of it as as being made up of a lot of lines, or or do you think of it as as being sort of a I don't know how to say this. There's no word for it in, in the in the traditional mm -hmm. description of music, but do you think of it as being an orchestrated one line or a, a color change, or do you think of it as being a count, counterpoint? Oh, I don't think of it as counterpoint. I think of it as, I guess, strands or lines. S strands, yeah. I think of it really, I think of it as plateaus. But when you say... I think of them as layers, like like a geological cut, you know, when you see that layer and that layer and that layer and that layer. But they're they're only layers in the sense that they're different colors because you don't really you don't really get into bass versus soprano. I mean, there's a lot of there's there is now in, in that last piece. Didn't you hear that at the end of that piece you've got the bass line you've got Joan singing that long line. Oh, when, with you, it. when you get into the, the I don't know what you call it, but that the, the cadence the cadence the, yeah. the long the long yeah. refrain. Well, one of the reasons I put that in was because uh, with music in twelve parts, well, we can talk about the. Oh, it was such a long piece to do. I spent three or four years. I spent much too much time on it. I think I spent three years on the piece. But by the time I got halfway through the piece, I decided, more than halfway through, I decided to change the rules. I just noticed that I had been operating under a lot of rules that had become automatic. Mm -hmm. And that I had, there were things that weren't possible to do in my music because I hadn't, I had made them forbidden. To yourself. You to mean, myself. Yeah. And uh, the whole latter part of Music in 12 Parts is gradually breaking down those rules, like starting from part 9, 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's just, by the time you get to part 12, I'm doing all the things that you can't do in part 1. It's chromatic. It's cadential. Yeah. I mean, all the, uh, 
Uh, and then in Einstein, I did the same. So then I took advantage of it. Like, the idea of using a real root movement in my music was really a forbidden thing for many, many years. I mean, there was yeah. a piece would start with a set of notes, and it would never change. There was no root movement at all. And I got, I just said, well, how is it possible that there's something I can't do? I mean, that seemed rather strange. Academic. It yeah. seemed academic. Yeah, I, can't I, do I can't I know. tie myself down like that. And I said, well, what is it I can't do? And I can't do cadences. And so I made a piece with cadences. Uh, I see. You yeah. know, it was a real a kind of a, a decision in a way. But it, besides being, it, I'm making it sound more intellectual than it really was because another thing that happened was that certain things that are left out, after a while, I kind of get a yen for them. Like if there's no root movement, and I haven't worked with root movement for six, seven years, after a while I just want to hear it. Yeah. I've, it's yeah. like I haven't had that sound for so long. And uh, it began coming to the music, and, uh, and maybe it was really more like I was starting to hear that because I hadn't heard it in so long. And then I th my first reaction was I couldn't do it, and then I said, well, why can't I do it? Well, there's this roll, and well, roll? <laughs> Who's making the rolls? I'm making the rolls. And then that was the end of the roll. But, uh, it wasn't so much like I looked at the music and said, this is missing, this is missing, therefore I'll put it in. But like with, cr with the chromaticism that came into the music, uh, after all that uh, pentatonic and white note music and all that, I mean, after a while, I just wanted to hear chromatic, uh, a chromatic flavor in the music somewhere. Yeah. And I started off with something that interested me very much was like uh, the, the minor scale has that ambiguous six and seventh degree that go, that can, and that seemed to me like a, a, a key to chromaticism for me. Like, how could I work that in? You know, I had to find a place in my music where that could, where it well, made some sense. Well, yesterday I heard, uh, I, I heard you sort of working at it bef before we actually started recording. And there are a lot of the parts in it that are, that are, that are modal in that in that way of you don't feel the root movement until everybody starts playing. Yes, that's you know, right. It, it 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 has it has a lot of the old qualities plus. Yes. The root Are you talking movement. about the fact that you really can't hear the pieces unless everyone's playing? Yeah. That's yes, it, that's, that's funny, isn't it? It doesn't it doesn't exist sort of. I mean, it's I, funny, isn't it? And the fact that there are only parts at this point. Yeah. In a way, the piece really exists when we sit down and play it, and it's given me. A I was going to ask you two other things before I forget, we can start talking about, it, but um. one is it it seems. It seems... John, um, could I, can I have something to drink? It seems... Uh, the, your music is so uh, accessible, technically. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you, because you can actually... It can be notated, mm -hmm. and it can be played on instruments yeah. that, that, are, that are available. Mm -hmm. Wh yeah. Why do you... But you've, I know you've told me many times that you don't want people to to play your music in that sense. Well, there's sense. several reasons for that. Why? Could you just say yeah. why that is? There's several reasons for that. For one thing is that I don't think, well, we spend a lot of time learning the music. I don't think anyone's going to spend that time. So you I don't mean think the, the music would be badly played? First of all, best, yeah. badly played. But th there's, uh, that's not as important. That's like not as important, I think, because I might even allow, I think eventually people could learn to do it, and there might even be some money involved, and I'm going to get the string. Yeah, yeah. Get the string from John. Oh, yeah, I'd like to. Oh, you got two? Okay, that's fine. Uh, Where did we start? How great, that's fine. Oh, uh, the real, I think the real reason we're, we're economic was, uh, was that I felt that uh, if you could... Uh, see, the thing is that at the point when I began really making a... I, I made a commitment to making a living as a musician who played yeah. music, as a practical musician, you want to call it. I don't know what else to call it. And uh, I don't know when that happened. It, that came out of part of my experience of having to make a living in New York. And that became as a result of my deciding that I wouldn't be a music teacher. Yeah. And that left me just uh, street jobs or music. Yeah. And at the point, the more I did the street jobs, the, the more you want to do music. The more I want. I mean, it just became. And I became very, uh, I, be I, I became clever at maximizing my possibilities of making money at my music because it was either that or putting in someone's sink or moving someone's furniture, and you know, it's survival. Yeah. I just didn't want to do it. I did it for years, and I didn't but want to do it. You mean not, you mean that playing your music, your music exclusively yourself? I wanted to do it. it, it well, it has to do with that, because it, my feeling was this, that if anyone could play my music, then the, uh, the likelihood of my being hired would be diminished. For mm -hmm. example, uh, there was a friend of mine. I, I, well, when I was, uh, there was some people that got a hold of a score of mine in England, and played a piece of mine there. Yeah. 
And I so very recently I just explained to them, I said, look, just don't do that. I said, and they said, well, we thought you would want to, you know. And I said, well, I was trying to arrange concerts in London. Now, one of the things I can do is I can say, I've never played my music in London. No one else has played it. If you want to hear my music, you've got to have me come and do it. Yeah. Now, yeah. that way, the fee can be very firm. Yeah. And it's just like, there are places that, and I'll just, like there's someone in Chicago who's asking me now to come and play, and I can say, well, if we can negotiate the money, and I can say, well, this is the fee, and they say, well, we don't have it. And I said, well, try to get it next year. Yeah. But I, I will, I'll rather wait a year. And they have no recourse. They can't say, well, where can we buy the music? Which is what normally would happen. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. So that uh, I have an economic lock on what it. I have a do you expect that, that eventually, uh, well, I don't know how to say this. Are you, it, can it change enough so that people could play music in 12 parts? No, I, mean, do, I don't you want don't to. Wanna, like, I'll tell you another thing. That, the, the real reason, the, the first reason was the economic one. As long as I'm the only one that has the scores, no one else yeah. can play it. Anyone yeah. who wants to hear it, they have to yeah. hire me. That's, and I still you know make my living from playing. Now, publishers have told me that I can make very good fees from Sounds performing cool. rights, but I just don't want to suffer through those bad performances, and I don't know, where am I going to get a sound system like the one I've got? I mean, that sound system took her about five years to develop, to fit yeah, this group. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you could rent a sound system, I suppose, but who's going to do it? Well, yeah, if, if, and if you, if you allow, allow people to play your music, they'd play it on anything. Anything. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you've got to face that, and I'm yeah, just not yeah, ready for that. Yeah. And the other thing is that there's another very personal thing, which is I find it very odd to hear someone else play my music. I have a funny feeling. Do you, does that, does that happen to you? I feel it, yeah. Terrible. I find it very peculiar. I just have to leave. It yeah. hasn't happened very much, you know. Yeah. But I just don't, uh, I just don't think I would like that, you know. The other, the other thing I was, this, this is about the second piece, sort of, yesterday. I was wondering, do you, do you have, uh, I have to figure out a way to ask the question so it doesn't sound just stupid. But do you do you think of of a format that you have to that you have to fulfill before you start, or is there is there some internal process for each of these pieces that that makes a piece last twenty well, minutes or thirty I minutes? I think it's the second idea. I think that what's happened is that uh, as I as I become you know uh, as I've written more and more music, what's happened is that. Uh, at the beginning, let's put it this way, go back. When I began writing music, I began rather technically. I learned how to write music yeah. from my teachers. And my first uh, music was modeled after them. And uh, I studied the same things that we all study, you know, all the harmony and counterpoint and all that. And uh, all the different, you know, the things you do as a student. Yeah. So that I knew a lot about music in terms of the, what models were there. Yeah. And for a long time, my music was built on the models. I'm talking about the music I wrote before I was 30. Yeah. I'm not talking about anything after 30. I, I think I, I began writing music when I was around 19. I began reading when I was 16, but I didn't get serious until I was about 19 and 20. And so there's about 10 years of music, which was strictly modeled after the people I studied with. There's not a note that's, there's not one note of it that's worth listening to, yeah, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I understand. It's, everyone I feel everyone has it. I got four or five boxes of it. It happened to be a lot in my case, because I, I write, I liked, I wrote a lot of music, so there's a lot of it, and some of it got published. It's, a, it's floating around. Some of it's been about, actually, about 20 pieces got published at different points, but most of it's gone, and I've, we've, I've left it there. And I didn't write any. I'd say I didn't write one note of original music until I was 30. I'm 39 now. So neither did I. <laughs> what? Neither did I. That's amazing. Yeah. Figure that it is but so common among you know, us. I, you know, when I meet like these young people and they're writing, they're so much further along than I was at their age. You know, when I was 25 and 26, I was. Wow. Well, I was I was living in somebody else's world. Yeah. I yeah. was writing music like Mio when I studied, you know, like William Burke's movies and Percy Ketty and all craftsmen of a kind, you know. Yeah. yeah. When, the, when I got involved with my own music and the models no longer existed, that's when things got interesting. As soon as I was on my own, and that was more or less an accident that that happened. I d d don't know why it happened or how it happened. It just happened to me that one day, I, literally overnight, I don't know, I was living in Paris. I didn't know anybody else. It wasn't like I was in California with, you know, when Terry and Lamont and Steve were all out there and they had each other. There was a scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there was. I was in Paris, and there was the only the scene was the Domaine Musical de Boulez run with an iron fist, you know. Yeah. There was nothing going through there except that serial stuff. And 
and some Earl Brown. Earl Brown was acceptable for some reason. They liked him. Yeah, I got well, to he, always, he, always, well, he was in Europe then. He was living yes. there. Yes, and, uh, but he, there was a different feeling to his music. It was odd for me to hear Earl, Earl Brown's music in the context of those concerts, because there was something so... I hate to use such a, you know, to use a word like it, there's something so sort of fascist about it, so... Organized. Organized and doctrinaire, and I never felt that he fit into that, Earl fit, but anyway, uh, for some reason they liked him and his music was done, and was, I think even I heard one piece of, Mo uh, of Morty Feldman's, maybe one, yeah. during that whole time I was there. Aside from that, I was living in a wasteland, uh, as far as I, yeah, I could see, uh, dominated by these maniacs. These complete creeps, you know, who were trying to make everyone write this crazy, creepy music. I know. <laughs> uh, and so I, my, I reacted to it violently, and I began doing this other music. My music, in a way, was a reaction to that. And the sustained quality was exactly against that. Uh, it, every, it was, in a sense, it was again one of those things where I didn't intellectually say, if, I'll do, if they're doing this, I'll do that. But it came out that way, because that's what I heard around me. I needed to hear something else. I needed to hear something extremely simple that was organized along lines that were perceivable and not just a bunch of gobbledygook that you read in program notes. And everything that my early music, and even to this moment, uh, a lot of it was, you can hear that way, and that's part of the reason why I've had so much trouble with that world. I mean, it's the music is a, my music is an affront to anyone who yeah. takes that kind of music seriously. But anyway, uh, uh, the more I got involved in this music, the, the less, in a sense, I've uh, depended on, on uh, composer's techniques for writing it. So when you say, well, how do I write the music? In a way, I can say truly that at this point, I really don't. I know less about how I write it now than I ever did before, and it's been a lot better for me, too. Now, I, I tell you, I, don't, I never think about music until I'm writing it. I don't have any ideas. My yeah. mind's almost always empty. But, but with the Einstein, with, with, the, with the work, the Einstein work. How did I do that? Well, let it, uh, we might as well say what it is. I don't know what... Oh, it's an opera that Bob Wilson and I are doing together. Yeah. It's about five hours, four and a half hours. But did you, did you decide in advance that you had to occupy five hours? We, and, we and set it out, yeah, out in we did that. Way? Yeah, yeah. That, because the only thing we had to, in common to work with at the beginning was a, was a time medium. Yeah, you both occupy we both large portions of time. So yeah. we said, well, we're going to be, how long will the piece be? How will we divide it up? We divided it up into four acts, into an hour for each act, into 10 or 15 minutes for each entre act. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Bob made some drawings, and I took the drawings, and I, I used that as a point of departure in a way. I, we, we set out themes, you know, like a, a train theme, a trial theme, a jail theme, um, a spaceship theme. Uh, actually, there were three themes. I'm not getting it quite right, but uh, and uh, we addressed ourselves to the themes as problems. And he began by making drawings, and I used the drawings. But in a way, I didn't. Uh, I I tell you how I did it. I I was living up in Canada at the time. Uh, I have this place up there. I go. I write a lot of music there in the summertime up in Cape Breton. And I got this little house in the little. Frame, a frame in the woods. It's really beautiful. It's a very ideal. It's the kind of thing uh, everyone should have. Every composer or a human being should have something like that. It's a little house in the woods, a frame. And I would, uh, I said, I almost never have any ideas about music. Uh, I, I work directly with. I mean, I don't have any ideas that I then have to translate into something. You know what I mean? I don't say I got an idea. <laughs> it never yeah. happens to me. Yeah. Never. I never get any ideas on music that way. What I do is I sit down, and one thing, this is another thing that I, when I was at Juilliard, I learned to write away from the piano how you're supposed to. Yeah. And I never write away from the piano. Yeah. It's totally it's unreal for me. So you just sit, you sit down and start, and then I sit down and I start playing. Come out. And it just comes out. And what I do with the drawings is I, I took Bob's book of drawings and I said, okay, first scene, put the drawing there, I looked at it, and I played the music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's not as easy as that. I mean, you, it doesn't, it isn't just a question of, playing it and then writing it down, it can take a little bit of time to work out. I'll find ideas that seem to be appropriate, and then I just kind of do it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how long. Well, in this case, I, it's become very um, subjective isn't quite the correct word. That, I don't mean subjective as opposed to objective. I mean, uh, I guess I mean semi-conscious in a way. I don't really. I, I've got all this technique now. I have. Uh, not only the technique that I learned as a student, which maybe some of it was useful, but anyway, I've got it. But the, all the technique of the last eight or nine years of writing the kind of music that I write now, I mean, I know how to do a lot of things. 
Our technique is, what technique is, is knowing how to do something. Yeah. I mean, isn't that, how you know, to start. How to start, how to make it, how to keep going and how to yeah. finish and all that stuff. Uh, I, I just know a lot of that stuff now. And, and I, I've always written a lot of music, you know, I've always, um, so I've done a lot. And so I've got that technique and I don't think about it. It's not that it's unconscious, it's just that I've got it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's no longer a problem. There can be problems in the music, but though, I don't know where they're from. There are problems in the music, but not so as you'd notice, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I... I, 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 I tell you, I really write. I sometimes... I, I'll tell you, what, I know when I'm ready to write a piece. Like do you it, feel it physically, or how do you, I mean, how I, do you know feel, when you're ready to write a piece? I just know it, Bob. I just, it's, like a, it's like something in my... something pushing out of my... I mean, it, but it comes a long, it takes a long time to come. I know, I told Bob, when we were beginning, that we were finishing this rehearsal period, and I, I just said to gee, I really, I want some time, I gotta, I have, I, I want to write a piece, and he said, what is it? I said, I don't know yet, but I knew I was ready to write a piece, and I hadn't felt the, that for a That didn't have anything to do with the Nothing author. to do with that, and the, almost a day after the piece was over, I sat down, I began writing a new piece. And uh, it's helpful in a way, because if I don't have that feeling, I won't bother. Yeah. I mean, I don't say, well, I've got to write a piece, and then I go, I, if I don't feel ready to do one, I, I don't know, I just don't want to do, I, I don't feel like working anymore unless I have that, unless I know that there's something to do. Yeah, you it sounds that, very yeah. subjective and romantic, doesn't it? When, yeah. Well, it's, I, you know, I, I, I don't, actually, that's really the way it is. And I can't, uh, I mean, I could say something else, but in fact, I have a feeling that I'm about to, I have a feeling I'm about to write a piece. It's like, you know how you know, you, sometimes people can tell you when the phone's going to ring? Yeah. You know? Or they know they're going to get a letter from somebody. It's yeah. that feeling. Yeah. It's you completely real. It's subjective. It's intuitive or whatever. Subjective isn't really the word I mean to use. It's very intuitive. I have... Yeah. Intuitive is a better word. Because I hate to use... Subjective always brings up the opposite of objective. And I don't mean that yeah. dichotomy. Because yeah. yeah. I don't think yeah. I'm living yeah. in that kind of dichotomy. But I think it's... Uh, I think what I mean is that the, it's, um, I just feel into it and I'm ready to do a piece. And then there'll be problems in the piece, maybe, about how to extend it. And then sometimes after the initial beginning of a piece, then I'll have to work through. And then, and then I'll start to use what I know. Yeah. I mean, all my, no my knowledge of instruments and structures and rhythmic structures. And if I get stuck, I'll say, well, let's see, what can I do here? And, and that I'll could take weeks or months or what? I mean, do you, do you have to leave things undone? Uh, no, lately, I, 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 uh, I used to take, music and 12 parts took me three years to write, but part of that was because I was working a lot of that time. Yeah. I had, street, I had job. street jobs, you know. Yeah. But uh, I now find I, I spend less and less time writing. It's very quick yeah. now. Uh, the scenes for Einstein, I figured out that I wrote that whole piece. I was just trying to figure out how much time did I actually spend writing it. Now, I wrote the piece, the, mo the mother of that piece was... Uh, Another look at harmony, which I did. Which I, which I've heard. You heard that. Yeah, but that that had some. Of, is that that's related that, to what? Yes, it is. I, I did that piece, and as I said, I call it the mother of this piece because I, I did that piece, and I knew it would be Bob's piece. I knew it was going to be the opera. Yeah. I, I got some money from the National Endowment to write a piece, and I wrote a concert piece, at the same time, using material that would become, the opera yeah. later. Yeah. And it was a uh, a piece that was like a uh, not a transition piece. A piece was right. It was a piece like a a halfway to the other piece. And uh, it was a way also of getting that material up and listening to it, because a lot of that material was very new. Mm -hmm. The whole, I, I call it another look at harmony, which is another one of my jokes in my title. I have a lot of jokes in my titles, and they aren't really very funny, but... Why, why another look at harmony? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, why did I call it that? It's a weird title. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I, I, you know, the, the guys in the band hated the title at first. Everyone's used to it now, but it's funny about titles, how they, after a while, they seem to be all right. Because, um, at the end of Music in 12 Parts, I had, we were talking about these rules and so forth. One of the things that never happened, there was no real harmony in my music before. There was uh, things happening on different harmonic plateaus, but there was no counterpoint. There were no root movements. There were no cadences. There were no modulations. Well, actually, that's not quite true. There were modulations in music with changing parts. And in Music in 12 Parts, there were modulations in the themes, in the parts, you know, the yeah. modulations always occur at the, the break. And they get more pronounced as more, the piece more goes pronounced. on. Yeah. And finally, it looked to me like I should, since modulation was becoming more and more the content and subject of the work, that I had to just face the issue of root movement very squarely and, and incorporate it into my music. And that's, and that meant harmony. And I just said, well, let's call it another look at harmony. Because, well, you know, when I was uh, a student, um, 
I had this teacher uh, in Europe I studied with. Uh, she was just uh, very involved in uh, traditional material. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I studied with her for two years. Uh, I was 28 when I, I was 26 when I went to study with her. I had my master's degree from Juilliard. And she made me start from the beginning again. And we started with harmony. So when I was 26 to 20, no, 27, 26, 27, 28, something like that, I was writing uh, first species counterpoint and harmony. Can you believe that? Yeah, I've heard of that. That's <laughs> Boulanger. That was Boulanger. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I did that for two years. And that's practically all I did. And uh, anyway, uh, that's, in, that's in my brain. I mean, that's like. <laughs> Have you? When I got involved with uh, my own music, one of the things I reacted besides the Boulos scene, I also reacted to that. So there wasn't any of that in my music. There was no yeah, harmony or counterpoint yeah. in my music. And then eight or nine years later, I said, well, it's coming back. And, yeah. and so the title was natural to me. For me, it was a personal, it was an autobiographical title. It was another look at harmony. The last time I had looked at it was nine years, years before when yeah, I had, yeah. at, uh, for stu studying music, that's fairly old, at 27, 28, to be writing first species counterpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit strange, but anyway. I don't know. I think it was valuable in a way. I can't. What were you going to ask? Me? Oh, I w are we are we talking? Are we covering? No, I, that, that was that was, the, that was the, the question. I mean, I'm sort of. But it seems like the music has always been harmonic, you know. So when you, it's not been. It, no, it's but it's not. not been noise. No, the, 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 what I'm talking about. I'm talking when I talk about another harmony. I'm talking about root movement. Yeah. I'm talking about a specific. I'm talking about functional harmony, root movement, whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about that specific. Uh, I'm talking about the technology of 18th and 19th century music. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think it's interesting that, uh, see, that music's in our popular music. You know, we've never left it. If you turn on, I listen to the radio a lot myself. I mean, I don't know what you listen to, but I, I listen to the radio. And I hear it all the time. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I hear it in, uh, I listen to WABC and, CBS you, and all that stuff, and that, that's what they're involved. A lot of the music world is involved with that. Yeah. They're not involved with the stuff we're involved with. You know, uh, you know, kids, these kids, any kids, when they start doing music, what they're going to do is learn changes. Yeah. The guys yeah. that I play with, they know changes. And that's what I'm, you know. We, there's a. Yeah, but you don't, but. See, I don't think of myself as part of that tradition of modern music, which comes, uh, for me, the Godhead isn't Schoenberg, Weber, and, and Berg. That's the problem with most of the people. And this is 1975. Can you believe it? Yeah, I know. In 1975, people are still worried about those problems. They're worried about the problems, the things that Brahms was worried about, really. Now, if that isn't conservative, what is? Do you, do you consider yourself to be, I don't know how you say it. Is, uh, is there is there a tradition that you come out of? That is there an older person for you? Uh, I mean, no, it, there are older people who I admire, but there is no one that. So was there the question? Was there anyone that I could model the music after? Yeah, the I mean, do you come out of that? Yeah. There are older people I felt a lot of sympathy to, because partly because of who they were in the world, and partly because of I felt that with Parch and felt that with Moondog, who yeah. lived. You know, oh, yeah. he lived at my yeah. house for yeah. about a year, and I. Uh, uh, I liked uh, yeah. and Cage, yeah. but I'm not close to him personally. But I always had, uh, you admire the break with that. I admire the that. break with and his ability Same, to stand yeah. on his own feet. Yeah, the, we've you know one of the things that we've had. Uh, there's a tradition in America. There's a maverick tradition in America that's very strong. It's Ives and Ruggles and Cage and Parch and Moondog and all these weird guys. And you're part of that tradition, don't you? That's think? my tradition. Yeah, that's yeah. my tradition, yeah. and that's why there and none of that's and people in that tradition don't have models. They only have models in terms of... They're social models yeah, or something like the, that. The, you, you the, the, way, the, way. the way they are in the world, in a way. Yeah. I mean, that's, the important thing about Cage was that you saw that it was possible. He was, an, uh, when I decided to commit myself to making a living as a composer, the only composer I knew who had done that was Cage. And of course, at the time, I didn't realize until more recently that it was really he wasn't until he was 50 that he was able to do that. He had a lot yeah, of hard a, years. But uh, in that sense, it's been a lot easier for me. I mean, I maybe had a few hard years, but yeah. it's not. It's well, been. Gener I think each generation is getting easier for. I think the, the younger people. It, is, it involves breaking that 
tradition We're breaking of, down that, of, uh, that tradition down, that, that uh, the academic tradition, the stronghold that they had on modern music. And yeah. it's not a believable one anymore. It's not an important one. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't continue. Well, but it seems it, it involves with not people don't believe now that that uh, or at least the people who listen to your music don't think so much that when you're older you're smarter. You know, that you're yeah. Well, the other thing is that what we're really fighting for, and it's not just me, but a lot of we're just fighting for an alternate tradition. Yeah. Of uh, and what we have on our side is uh, we have an audience. Yeah. That's real important. Oh, you definitely have an audience. Yeah. I mean, you have a very, very solid audience. Well, that, that's they respect. That you. makes it somehow the work. Yeah. We can exist in the world in a way we don't need anyone's permission, yeah. because we have something else. Uh, but I think that alternate tradition that I'm that I I think that I relate myself to that. Yeah. I call it the Maverick tradition, and yeah. the I don't know what else to call it, but it's uh. Perez was part of it. There are a lot yeah. of, if you think about it. All the it, people you respect are part of it. All the people you hear about are part of it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the people, I, it's not that I don't like their other composers I like enormously. I like, of, that, of the older composers, I, I like Virgil Thompson a lot. I always thought he was interesting. Sort of a maverick, don't well, you think? He was, in a way. I always liked him in a way, and I liked, uh, uh, I thought Cal was interesting. Huh? Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, Lou Harrison is interesting. I mean, I think all these people, I yeah. think Lou Harrison is interesting. And, but none of these people, whether they teach or don't teach, isn't so important, though generally these people were not involved with schools. And they generally were, if you look at what we really have in America, we have the academic, which is most of everybody, and then you have this trickle that runs alongside of it, which is where the, that's where you find the gold. You don't yeah, find I it in, the, in that mainstream at all. Uh, all the people that are the heads of the, the people that are heads of the big music schools. I mean, they're not. Uh, <laughs> they're, it's not. They're anyone that's involved with it. So I mean, I think it's that we're, they're part of that that mainstream, which just doesn't have any appeal for me. And and uh, it's okay. You know? it's okay. It's just nothing to do with me. Do you, apart from apart from the Maverick tradition? Do you think of yourself, do you think of your music as having any, uh, what, <laughs> political connections or is it no. part, no, you, this because you, you said to me two or three times that you're, that you're, you think of yourself as being part of the, the working class. I mean, it's, and that's nice. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a <laughs> huge, it's a huge tradition in, really? I didn't, of, I didn't know I put it quite that way. Well, I have a history. I didn't mean about your music, but you, no. but the, it's so practical, you know. And oh, I see what you mean. Well, uh, what was the question? You, do you think of it at all? I mean, the, oh, political. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. No, I don't. I, 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 uh, I think it's, for me, it's a bad joke, and and I have very little sympathy with the composers, and they're, some of them are friends of mine. I, I have very sympathy for the idea that music can be used for a political social purpose. Yeah. I, I just think it's silly, but that doesn't mean that it, those people aren't totally serious, and yeah. I, I try to take it seriously, but personally, and I've had talks with them, some people that are friends and that can talk to about this, you know. But uh, for one thing, um, it's not, first of all, I have a, my, a personal history of having worked a lot, you know, of having, you know, worked all kinds of jobs, like from the steel mills to in Baltimore to, uh, you know, being a plumber or a furniture mover, or so many things, working in factories and so many things I can't remember. So that my in involvement with um, working people is uh, it's a very long one, you know. Yeah. I, mean, so yeah. I, I know who those guys are in the steel mills because I used to work with them. And the idea of, of my going in there and playing music for them strikes me as very, very silly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know those guys. I mean, what they're talking about is how, when I was in the steel mills, what we were talking about was how you could rip off the company. And, mo and a lot of those people were driving around in fancy cars and had ice boxes and new refrigerators. And I mean, the working class in America, and those were black people too, I'm not just yeah. talking about the white people. Uh, this is down in Maryland. Uh, the working class in America is a very middle class. I mean, to even think that there is, we don't have a European working class or a Eastern European working class or a, Asian working class, we have something a bit different. And if you spend any time with those people, you find out that, that they think, you know, they think that if you, an artist is just a way of being at the nine to five rap. For them, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you, I, you talk to them and say, well, 
I remember going in to some of these places I used to work and there'd be something in the paper about a painting selling for like $500,000 and they'd say, you know, my kid can do better than that, you know, and I said, well, you ought to do it, you know, and they, we talked about it and they said, well, what do you think of it? And I said, well, if you think you can do it, you know, get it on, you know. And they, uh, they, they, they have a lot of contempt for artists and for the way that we live and I don't say that they, they have the reasons for it, but the idea that there's going to be some rapprochement between those two worlds, well, not unless someone, we, they're not going to change. I mean, you'd have to, you know, like, that's what I think popular music did. I think popular music is a, is a plug into that. Yeah. I think that that's, that, that is possible in that way. Would you, could I, I think but we I just have, we're sort of, would you let your music be popular? I mean, if, if, if it started going in that direction. How could I do that? Well, it, you, you, it, it, I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you let it start, if you let it tour, I mean, for instance, if Oh, you, I mean, if we went on a tour. Yeah. It's a I question mean, of, a, uh, we, we've talked about I mean, isn't, that. isn't there some sort of, you always make those decisions about recordings and, and, uh, and touring. And that no, kind of I thing. tell you, for me, it's a lot of a, I'm not, I don't like, uh, I've toured a lot, I don't, I have to do it. That's the, the way we really make our money is doing yeah, concerts. Yeah. Don't make much from records and don't make much in any other way. And as far as I can tell, talking to other musicians, that's where they make their money too. You know, yeah, so uh, you people go on the road for longer than I do. I mean, Arnett's been in Europe for six months now. Or uh, the bands go out. You know, those are hard. That's how even people that are supposedly you know well-known, famous people they make. That's if you get in with a big record company, maybe. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about pop people, that's different. I'm talking about, see, jazz our, musicians and, yeah. that's, our economic situation is more similar to jazz than to yeah, pop. Yeah. And uh, you can find parallels in the jazz world much easier than you can in the world of pop. And for that, jazz musicians have to work very hard and they have to work, do a lot of road work. The pop music is a bit different. There you can do maybe a few big splashy concerts and make enough to yeah, do. Yeah. And the record companies are make the, the money's coming from the records there. I mean, the difference between Someone like Keith Jarrett and, uh, and the Rolling Stones is maybe a couple million records yeah. sold. I mean, and I, you know, I, I may like both of them. And personally, I may like both of the music, but let's say, I don't know what his sales figures are, but let's say that he puts out a solo record. I'm talking about Jarrett, and let's say he sells maybe 20, 25, I don't know, I don't know yeah, if that's, yeah, I don't but it could be, that for jazz, you see, 25,000 is a lot for a jazz record to yeah. sell. But it still doesn't make him any money. The, you don't make money in a record company you're selling over 7500,000.
Thank you.
Thank you.